Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Rollback, the series that introduces a selection of pre-video audio only episodes of our show to YouTube for the very first time. And today's episode is all about loving kindness, how we can better cultivate and expand our experience of love in our daily lives with Meta Meditation Master, Sharon Salzberg. Sharon is a world-renowned meditation teacher and New York Times bestselling author who's played a crucial role in bringing meditation and mindfulness practices to mainstream Western culture, dating all the way back to 1974. She's the author of 11 books, including Loving Kindness, Real Happiness, Real Change, and Real Love, The Art of Mindful Connection, which was the focus of this conversation recorded back in the spring of 2017. Sharon is also our regular columnist for On Being. She's a contributor to HuffPo and the host of her own podcast, The Meta Hour. This conversation is one of my favorites and serves as a deep dive into Sharon's extraordinary life. It's a discussion about how we think about and practice love, both for ourselves and for others, and examines how meditation can help us master what Sharon considers to be the three most essential skills in life, compassion, mindfulness, and concentration. I think you're really gonna love the product of our exchange, so please hit that subscribe button and enjoy episode 298 with Sharon Salzberg. Thank you for taking the time to chat today. No, it's it's a great delight, really. Yeah, so um, maybe, you know, perhaps the best sort of intro point or way into this is just to crack it wide open with with real love i mean this is the name of the new book um it's great i'm about halfway through it oh, i'm not good. i'm not totally done with it but <laughs> uh, it's fabulous congratulations yeah thank I, you so i can't much. wait for people to experience uh the beauty and the wisdom in that so you know why don't you define for us what real love is you know what's the difference between how we you know conceptualize love in our current culture and you know your your take on it that's the killer question isn't it, is, it? right <laughs> what is we'll just we just spend the next two hours talking about this <laughs> what is real love <laughs> i have to figure it out <laughs> um i usually talk about it as a state of really profound connection that needs to take it take that concept away from kind of the adornments you know and the elaborations that the culture puts on it that it has to be romantic it has to have a certain flavor. Uh, almost the whole book, actually, oddly enough, was born out of this one line in a movie, the movie Dan in Real Life. Um, the line goes, love is not a feeling, it's an ability. Mm. And, of course, we know it as a feeling, we yearn for it as a feeling, we think of it constantly sometimes as a feeling. But what if we reconceptualize that as an ability, some capacity we have within us that's not in the hands of someone else? but is really part of us and that other people may awaken it or enliven it or nourish it or threaten it, but it's within us. So mm -hmm. I realized that without that shift, I, I tended to think of love as a, a commodity and it was almost like a package. And it's like the UPS person was standing in the doorstep with that package in his hand and changed his mind and went the other way. And it'd be like, hey, wait a minute, you know, right. I've lost all the love in my life, but really it's within us. And uh, that was a huge shift for me. And how did you, well, I guess that's going to bring it back. I want to get into the whole origin story. We'll, we'll, we'll work our way towards that for, for context. Um, but you break the book up into three sections. It's basically love for oneself, love for others, and, and love for all, right? Yeah, and, right? And you kind of, um, it's a journey towards reclaiming this word and freeing it of all the baggage that we kind of associate mm -hmm, with it mm -hmm. and, and, you know, placing it in a context really as a verb, right. And not yeah. something to be, um, not this sort of state or something that we're striving for or trying to get from another, right. but trying to yeah. really kind of germinate and That's cultivate right. within ourselves. That's right. And it, uh, I think that, that realization has every level to it, including the fact that maybe it's up to us then, you know, which can be a little scary. Right. Like, whoa, wait a minute, you know. I was we don't want to the... take personal responsibility, yeah. you know, that's yeah. no fun. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that, oh, well, you know, maybe the package is a better deal. But, um, yeah, it has lots of levels, but that's exactly it. When I mm -hmm. first was thinking about this book and, and 
uh, kind of creating it and I talked to someone in publishing about it. They said to me, oh, the love market's really saturated. You know, it's right. like it's so overdone. And I thought about that and, and I thought, well, maybe the how to fix your relationship market or how right. to the find ro- your relationship. Romantic love That's right. market. You know, but this is something, this is something very different. It's not a mistake that, that, you know, the first section is cultivating love for oneself, right? And, and I think we, you know, in our current society, think of self-love as indulgent or selfish or narcissistic mm-hmm. or an exercise of the ego. But mm-hmm. really, you know, cultivating love for oneself is a foundational component in, in actually even having the capacity to love other people. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think we tend to think of uh, self-love as narcissism. And being selfish and, and like you say, self-indulgent. But I think it has two really amazing components. One is a sense of inner resource, not feeling so exhausted and bereft and impoverished within, but having a sense of inner sufficiency or even inner abundance, which becomes like the source of being able to give and care and take care of others. You know, it's like if you feel like you've got nothing going on inside, nothing to contribute, uh, it's kind of a really bleak and hollow world within you don't look at somebody in pain and think, how can I help you? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, go away. I'm really tired. You know, it's too much. I can't bear it. And we truly can't bear it in that moment. Uh, but we have the capacity to um, have a very different view of, of our inner life and our experiences so that it doesn't feel so bleak and it doesn't feel so uh, not good enough. Mm-hmm. And uh, the other part of the love for oneself is self-compassion, which really comes into play not in our triumphs, you know, in our great days, but when we've blown it and we've made a mistake or we've fallen off a course that we want to stay on or uh, whatever it is, you know, to be able to pick ourselves up and start over and have a sense of resilience really takes some examination. A lot of people think self-compassion is laziness. It's like, yeah, so what? I'll forgive myself. I'll mm-hmm. blow it again in 10 right, seconds. Like letting so yourself what? off the hook for everything. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. That's right. But really, I think when we look at What's most effective and most efficient in making a change or getting something done? It's not going on a harangue towards yourself for like five and a half hours after you've blown it. You know, it's like saying, okay, lessons learned or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or that doesn't feel very good. Or what can I do to make amends and then start over? Most of us walk around with an inordinate amount of self judgment yeah. and self criticism and doubt and you know an undercurrent of worthlessness or you know I'm not worthy of love and and we play this tape in our mind right and and I think when you're in that spot um, whether it's victimization or just sort of you know wallowing in your own fear or what have you you tend to look outside yourself for love. Like you, you, you look at another person as being the missing mm-hmm. variable in that equation that's going to solve that for mm-hmm. yourself as mm-hmm. opposed to that inward journey of, of cultivating it within. But the problem, of course, is that nothing you know will actually fill that gap. Right. You know? Nothing outside. And then uh, I took in the book. We know lot. that intellectually. <laughs> oh, but like we do. We, you know, well, I, I, a lot of people do, and we st- but we still do it. You of know? course we do it, you know, and it hurts so much. <laughs> it's I really know. sad. Um, of course we do it, but <laughs> that's worthy of some self-compassion right there. Um, but we don't have to do it in as obsessed a way and as deluded a way, perhaps, as we once did, because we can see clearly. We can see for ourselves. You know, the I think that the world is, is built of so many myths and just untruths and uh, we're led to believe so many things that simply aren't true. Mm -hmm. And we incorporate them. We, we run around trying to find the perfect, whatever. Um, And sometimes we can step back and say, wait a minute, do I really need that? Or what's the nature of that? And even love itself comes onto that, that idea because so many times people think of love as being stupid or, you know, like sentimental or, or Something, weak. Or weak or saccharine. And, and, you know, what's really strong is like vengefulness or whatever. But when you look at those states, just look at them. Uh, it's kind of the opposite, actually. Vengefulness is very narrow, very much tunnel vision, very much um, not seeing any options. Uh, hate, hateful, you know, it doesn't feel really that good. And it's kind of brittle, you know, it's not really that strong. But Love or compassion are, are states of tremendous like spaciousness and um, 
presence and you know energy and generosity they are actually stronger than we think yeah i think it's a it's a position of strength but it lacks that rush you know that we get addicted to yeah. like we can become yeah. addicted to that anger response or yeah. vengefulness yeah. and those are i think i've heard you describe it they're they're like brush fires you know they yeah. They, yeah. they burn very intensely yeah. but ultimately they're not sustainable over the yeah. long run yeah. you're right and so you know love and compassion are deeper reservoirs that can sustain us over the yeah. long haul yeah. and you know i can't we can't talk about this without sort of contextualizing it with what's going on currently culturally yeah. 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 you know we're in a we're in a tremendously divisive situation at the moment uh socially and we see a lot of anger. We see a lot of, it's almost like suddenly there's permission for a lot of this anger and vengefulness and, mm -hmm. and resentment mm -hmm. to birth itself and, and manifest itself in, in some pretty unhealthy ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, how does, how does real love play into that in terms of how we navigate the world and, and respond to that and, you know, tend to our own emotional bodies? And, you know what I mean? Like in terms mm -hmm. of boundaries and, and, you know, just the daily conversations that we have. Mm -hmm. I think it has a lot to do with balance. It's like um, there, there's a real need to, and I don't know that we ever understand these things intellectually or analytically, but to explore terrains of what could it possibly mean to have love and compassion for ourselves and for someone else at the same time? Or what could it mean to have compassion for someone and realize I agree with nothing they are proposing and I'm going to fight? But not perhaps from a place of hatred, a um, place of of neutrality. Or... Yeah, it's a place of of balance, of of wishing that everyone could be free, and that I mean I, I've worked with people, for example, with horribly abusive parents. I mean horribly abusive parents who said, "I can't find the phrase." You know, like what would I possibly uh, be offering? You know, and I said, "Can you say maybe free of hatred?" And they said, "Yeah, that I can say." Mm -hmm. Um, and something like that. It's, it's, it's a profound exploration, but I really do believe that our kind of corrosive, rigid sense of self and other, where the other doesn't count, you know, it doesn't matter, um, is at the root of, of a lot of the really scary stuff that's going on. I find it scary too. You know, I live part time in New York City, uh, in Greenwich Village, and, you know, a block away, people are painting swastikas on walls. And I think, wait a minute, you know, like, mm -hmm. this is really scary. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think fear is the basis for going forward in a, in a good way, in a skillful way. And I think the sense of otherness, like it doesn't matter what happens to you. You're like a chair, you know, you're not like a person, right. um, is at the root of a lot of that behavior. And so I don't want to perpetrate that myself. Uh, but I also do strongly believe in the power of love or the strength of love and compassion. It's not like being meek and obsequious and giving in, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's a whole other source of, of strength that can have us, have us really fight. There's a phrase in, uh, in recovery parlance that's, that goes like this. Uh, you cannot give something that you haven't got. Uh, do you think that applies to, you know, how you, how you think about love in the sense that you're really not capable of truly loving another, uh, and until you love yourself, are they are they exclusive in that regard? I actually don't think they're that completely exclusive. Um, I had a conversation with this woman, Bell Hooks, in New York City, and she called me on that. You know, she didn't agree with that. She uh -huh. thought they were. You really had to love yourself before you could love someone else. She said, "You can care for someone or care about them, but you can't really love them unless you love yourself." And I said, "Well, you know, I, I feel like I know people." who do love others, but you can't in the long term sustain that without love for yourself. Then right. you know, generosity becomes martyrdom or gets weird or distorted and you're no longer actually really caring. You're, you know, calculating like how much have I given you that you're not returning, you know? Yeah, you're taking a balance sheet. But yeah. I, I think that, that there is a sort of act as if mentality that you can appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, 
I'm thinking of this, that animated video that you voiced yeah. the other day. Yeah. I shared that on social media the other day. It's so beautiful. Were you like a llama? What was the, uh, what was the I, animal I was that you're a dog? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> but it's basically the story. You could tell the story better than I, but essentially it's, it's, you know, how we interact with the people on a daily basis, the cashier at the restaurant or the store and how we look through them as opposed to, you mm-hmm. know, at them. And this idea that you, even if you're not feeling it like to, you know what, I'm going to make mm-hmm. a choice. I'm going to, I'm going to actually engage this person yeah, that's right. and, and, and try to, you know, see them as a, a whole human being. Yeah. And yeah. even if you're lacking that compassion yeah. for yourself, that, you know, sort of adopting that behavior modality, uh, can reframe yeah. how you, you know, not just interact with others, but how you see yeah. yourself in the sense that, you know, self-esteem comes from performing esteemable acts. And if you get yeah. into the habit of yeah. doing that, you yeah. are cultivating self-love in some regard by loving yeah. others. Oh, I think you really are. That's, that's well, well said. And, and there's something about that act that returns us to something inside of ourselves that is whole, mm-hmm. you know, that may be hidden or hard to see or obscured in some way. But in that act, if it's done, you know, purely, uh, that's what we touch in on again. It's like, oh. And that, you know, the reason for the animation was, which I also think is ex- extremely cute. It's really cute. Um, I've never seen I said when I shared it, I was like, I should actually watch this every day because <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to be reminded, you know, I look through people as much as the next yeah, person. Sure. We know? all do. Um, you know, it's sort of like the second great controversy after love is weak and sort of stupid is that um, I think. In Eastern philosophy, love is quite trainable. Uh, it's a skill, and it's a skill. It's it's trainable because it's based on how we pay attention, and we know attention is trainable. That's all that meditation is: is training attention. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you're forcing yourself to feel something you don't really feel, or you're you're being hypocritical and covering over some really difficult feelings with this little veneer, you know, of sweetness. It's not like that. But paying attention differently will lay the ground for love to emerge, and so. It's it's completely here too. It's almost in our hands, you know. Right. Do we want to cultivate that skill or not? So, like you said, you go into that store and you look at the person, not through them. Mm-hmm. Something happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, by honing your attention, by really focusing on your attention, by practicing this skill, uh, you create that space that yeah. allows it yeah. to come in. And, and I like that idea because it allows you to take personal responsibility for your ability yeah. to love yeah. others and yourself as opposed to waiting for it to come, you know, yeah. in this, you know, romantic notion of right. how we, you know, sort yeah. of typically think about love. Yeah. How do you think of, how do you communicate about this subject with, men versus women like is there a, a, a difference in the, in the vocabulary that you use i mean i think that it's it's you know am i going far afield to say that you know it's trickier with men because men are a little bit more clamped down and you know even saying the word out loud can be challenging for mm-hmm. a lot and it, it it sort of um it sort of uh challenges you know, ideas about masculinity and, mm-hmm, and strength mm-hmm. and all these, you know, kind of cultural identity issues that get played into. Well, another uh, genesis of the book was a um, conversation I had with a, a friend of mine who's a man who, who was saying that in his mind, the movement from a more um, conventional kind of love to more of a state of real love was in a way moving out of the center of privilege to really listen to his partner in a different way. So he said, you know, his wife suggested something he didn't really want to do, but he thought, you know what, it works for her. And it's not that convenient for me, mm-hmm. but it's what she wants. So why should everything be referenced to my needs, you know, and my demands? And um, and I, I would say to him in response, you know, there are an awful lot of people, usually women in this world, who never voice their demands or their, their needs. You know, so for them, moving to a more real kind of love or a liberated kind of love might be actually expressing what who they are, mm-hmm. you know, and what they desire. And I like those two polarities. They're actually both in the book. Um, I changed his name, but uh, you know, uh, it was it was so interesting to me to watch that. I mean, mm-hmm. I think there is movement and growth for anybody, and depending on your, if you think about it as balance. Uh, although it's not that you know sexy a word, but I think it really is a state of balance. It's a state of some repose or harmony, 
and we're out of harmony one way or another. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story I told about from the women's side was about a friend of mine who uh, outlived her cancer prognosis, I think by 40 years, something like that. And she was telling me about her early healing journey when she was first sort of looking at her life and everything in her life. And she said, I used to be the kind of woman who I'd be sitting in the car with my husband, boiling hot, and the most I could ever bring myself to say is, are you warm, dear? <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. So that's a big contrast to my other friend, you know, who who's saying, you know what? It can't all be about me. Right. And so I think that's also, that's like the magic of a, a creative process, you know, is is that dynamism of leaving where we are if we're stuck and in some kind of rut and moving to another place. Mm-hmm. Of getting outside yourself yeah. and your own ideas yeah. and, and needs yeah. and, and thinking about those of the other. Yeah. Or your own, in her yeah. case, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you, it, it, when you talk about love and real love, is this a unifying singular concept? Because I, when I think about love, I think, you know, well, there's the way I love my wife and that's different from how I love my kids and how I love my parents. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you parse that? Um, I think it's both, you know, the manifestation, the feeling will be very different. And people would often ask that in, in classes, like, I want to love everybody, but I kind of like my husband a lot, you know, <laughs> yeah. like do I have to give him up, you know? Do you have to go back in the pool or something, you know? Uh, no, I mean, of course we have, I mean, we would say, you know, in, in Buddhist teaching, we'd say we have different karma with different people, but, um, you know, that's a little bit esoteric a way of saying it, but we do have different roles or relationships with different people. They're going to feel very different. Mm-hmm. They're going to manifest differently. Uh, but there's something about that kind of pure connection where we're just there that I think is actually the same. Mm-hmm. And it's it's maybe maybe most complicated actually with children because of the responsibility of, you know, needing to protect them and take mm-hmm. care of them and so on. But it goes back to honing your attention. Yeah. Right. And mindfulness yeah. and, and, yeah. and meditation and, you know, that, that journey to being able to do that. Right. And yeah. we're going to, we're going to yeah. talk about that. Yeah. So let's contextualize this. I want to, I want to go back to the, to the, you know, the origin story here. Because uh, it's quite remarkable, the journey that you've been on to be able to do what you do today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So take me back to the early days in New York City and, and your My life. Oh, you know. yeah. So I had a very um, traumatic, you know, uh, disordered, chaotic kind of childhood. I, uh, When I wrote this book called Faith, I looked back, which is sort of my faith journey. I looked back and I realized that by the time... I went to uh, college at the age of 16. I'd lived in five different family configurations. Every one of them uh, shifted because of a death or some loss or some profound um, craziness. And so my parents got divorced when I was four. My father disappeared. And I lived with my mother and her siblings until I was nine. And then my mother died very suddenly. Mm -hmm. And I lived with my father's parents, whom I hardly knew. My father didn't reappear for another couple of years. So my grandfather died, his father died. And then my father came back and he was back for about six weeks when he took an overdose of sleeping pills and ended up in some mental health facility or another for the rest of his life, which was, you know, pretty extensive. Um, So either VA hospital, nursing home, or sometimes on the streets if he would run away or something like that. And sometimes he'd be better and sometimes he'd be not so well. So, Was there a diagnosis for that? Well, I think his actual diagnosis was paranoid schizophrenic. Whether in those days um, those were done with tremendous accuracy or not, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I then I lived with my grandmother until I went to college at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. So that that made so five five different incarnations and 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 a tragic, you know. Yeah. Occurrence in each one of those that you had to yeah. weather at a very early age. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the trauma of that, I, I can't even fathom. 
it's amazing you made it through that and, mm-hmm. and you know, were able to kind of get through high school and get yourself yeah. to college, yeah. right? Yeah. Do you remember feeling like when you went away to, you went upstate to college? Yeah, I went to Buffalo, yeah. Buffalo. So do you, do you remember feeling a, a, like a sense of free, like I need to get away from this or what was the, you know, kind of emotional I did, experience? Yeah, and it, wasn't finally... exa- it was close to that. It wasn't exactly I need to get away from this, but I, I kept thinking there's something else. Mm-hmm. There's something. And, 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 and how were you carrying your suffering at that time? I was like completely isolated. I was very shut down. I was very unhappy, but not expressive of it. I mean, didn't know how to, I didn't even know what was happening mm-hmm. within me. It was actually only when I started meditating, uh, when I went to India that I began uncovering kind of the range of what, right. you know, the range of what I was experiencing, which was rage and fear and, you know, sadness and all of these things. And I found that shocking. You know, I didn't know I felt this. Right. Yeah, you talk about that in the book, the experience that a lot of people have when they when they begin, you know, kind of an intensive meditation practice for the first time, they think they're all good, you yeah, know, and then yeah. suddenly they're crying uncontrollably yeah, and they yeah, have all this yeah. rage or whatever. And they're like, I yeah. thought this was supposed to make me I thought I was happy. Right? Yeah, really? you know, like, Where's the like, this is this is a jip, you know, yeah, yeah. and you're saying, no, you're exactly where where you need to be because you're actually confronting your suffering for the very first yeah, time. No, that's and that's true. that's part of this process process of, you know, acknowledgement and, and ultimately yeah. working through it. I mean, this is a little bit, my story is a little bit in this book. It's it's much more extensively in this book, Faith. And many, many people come up to me and say, I had a childhood just like yours, or mm. I really understand. So it's, it's hardly rare, mm-hmm. actually. Mm-hmm. All right. So you're in Buffalo and you find yourself in like an Asian studies class, right? <laughs> Do you remember what pulled you towards that class to begin with? Was there like an, uh, a conscious or unconscious, you know, magnetizing it's, force to that? It's a little bit like some of it was really just convenience. It fit into my schedule. Yeah. I needed to do a philosophy course because it was a requirement. Some of it was, it was kind of in the air. You know, the Beatles had gone to India. Right. And everyone was like. The Maharishi. Yeah, the Maharishi was around. <laughs> People were looking at like Indian music and sitars and you know chai hadn't hit yet you know that hadn't come in uh-huh. that much later but <laughs> uh, or the clothes but you know it was it was what was happening i went to school in the 60s mm-hmm. you know um and it was really in the asian philosophy course that um, two things happened one was in the component on buddhism which was most of it when i heard the buddha say there's suffering in life that this is a natural part of life um it was the most probably the most liberating thing I'd ever heard. Because right, to be born is to suffer. To be born right. is to suffer. And, and it was finally the thought, it's not just me. You know, because I'd been so different from everybody else all those years. Like, what do you say in French class when you're supposed to say what your father does for a living in French? It's like, I don't know how to say this. Mm-hmm. You know, or, uh, and suddenly there was no sense of being excluded. You know, it's like, we're all suffering. This is not always, you know, not not that life is horrible, but there's always suffering in someone's life somewhere along the line. And and that's the truth. And I felt incredibly freed just by that statement. And then I heard about these practices called meditation where you could actually do something about your mind and be happier. And it was like, I looked around Buffalo, New York, and at that time, yeah. I didn't find it anywhere, you know. might have been there, but now it's probably everywhere. But uh I just didn't see it. So the school had an independent study program where if you created a project that they liked, you could go anywhere uh, for a year, theoretically, Mm -hmm. and then come back. So I created a project. I want to go to India. Right. It's interesting. Do you think that if you had decided to go to like City College in New York or or something like that, that you would have ended up in analysis instead? (laughs) (laughs) You know? I never never thought of that. In like a very Woody Allen kind of way? (laughs) That's very funny. I never thought of that. No, I, I don't think no, so. No, uh, uh. I mean, <laughs> you know, when we finish telling your whole story, I mean, it's it's always that thing of like when you look back in the rearview mirror, everything lines up perfectly. Uh, you, do you do you think about it in terms of of fate? Do you feel like like you know like this was on some level a, a predestined course for you, or that you were tapping into some kind of past life experience that led you towards this? Uh, I don't think of it exactly as firmly as fate, but uh, I think it was meant to be in mm-hmm. a way, you know, like, or I, I managed, somehow I managed to use it in a way that was right really good. Like when, you know, I stayed in India for more than a year, I came back, finished school, went back to India. And then when I was leaving in 1974, 
for what I thought was going to be a very brief visit home. Before I lived in India for the rest of my life, I went to see one of my teachers who was a woman named Deepama. Deepama is like a nickname, Deepa's mother. Uh, and uh, she was a woman who had suffered terribly in her life. And that's how she'd gotten into practice. She had three children, two of whom died. Her husband died really suddenly. Uh, and she developed this heart condition. She like went to bed. She, she was living in Burma at the time. She couldn't get out of bed. And the doctor came and said, you're actually going to die of a broken heart unless you do something about your mind. You should learn how to meditate. Mm-hmm. So she got out of bed. And uh, she went to the retreat center. And when she emerged, somehow she had metabolized all of that horrible grief and pain into some kind of compassion for everybody. It was like this enormous radiance she had. And uh, she was my teacher. And so I went to see her say goodbye for my short, short trip home. And she said, when you get to the States, you'll be teaching. And I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. Mm -hmm. And And you're like 21 at this point. I was 21, yeah. yeah. And, And she said two things that were really amazing. The first was, she said, you really understand suffering. That's why you should teach. And that was the first moment I ever thought that everything I had been through had like a purpose sort of. Right. Uh, and then she said, you can do anything you want to do. It's only your thinking you can't do it that's going to keep you from doing it. Right. And and I think it's it's that knowing your suffering and owning your suffering and, and leveraging that suffering as a vehicle for yeah. healing not only yourself but yeah. others yeah. that has really been yeah. the touchstone of yeah. your life. Yeah. But to take it back, uh, just to kind of back into the timeline here a yeah, little bit sure. before you before you meet Deepa Ma. I mean, you you go. Uh, you have this great story where even before you go to India, you met with a Tibetan Chukur, monk, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. like, "What should I do when I get to India?" Yeah. And he's like, "What does he?" Uh, he says, "Follow the follow the pretense of accident." That's right? Right. And you're like, "I don't know what that means," right? Right. It's well, only it's only later <laughs> that you understand, yeah. but you go and you're kind of meandering around India, and you find yourself at this, um, at this ashram for this meditation retreat, and you know, unbeknownst to you, you're surrounded by all these people that yeah. ultimately yeah. Um, return like yourself and become leaders in this yeah. meditation yeah. movement yeah. throughout the West. Yeah, Joseph Goldstein, Ram Das, Krishna Das, right. Dan Goldman. I mean, yeah, I mean, unbelievable, yeah. right? That yeah. that was your first meditation retreat. Like yeah. when I see that, when I, when, I mean, it's like it gives me chills. It's like oh, oh, this is you're exactly where you're supposed to yeah. be. This was yeah. like perfect for you, and this is yeah. all meant to be unfolding in the way that it did. Yeah, I, I think it was. I, I I look back at that, you know, that particular era, mm-hmm. and I think amazing. You know, we're all Crazy. still so close, and we're all still like doing it in yeah. some way or another. And Ramdas was Ramdas at that That's point, right? right? Yeah, I mean, he Ram had Dass. already, you know, he had already had quite a bit of fame yeah. and notoriety. I yeah. mean, Be Here yeah. Now came out when came out then. Came he got the box when we were there together. Oh, he did! Wow, yeah, it arrived and was like, "Look at this!" You know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like 1971. Uh huh. Do you know? You probably know Bhagavan Das. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He actually he married my wife and I. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So for those who don't know, Bhagavan actually was a lanky teenager who ultimately led Ram Das to Neem Karoli Baba, right? Uh-huh. And introduced them and yeah. Neem Karoli Baba becoming Ram Das's teacher and, you know, the rest is history. Um, amazing, right? So so you have this initial meditation retreat and this is your introduction. I mean, that began as a Vipassana retreat, yeah, right? Yeah, it was a Vipassana retreat. And it kind of ended with you being introduced to, yeah. to Metta. So, yeah. so maybe describe the difference between uh-huh. Uh-huh. those two traditions. Okay, so Vipassana is... Um, a word in Pali, which is the language of the original Buddhist text, it just means insight meditation. So uh, that one particular style of doing meditation has come to be associated with the word Vipassana. The teacher was S.N. Goenka, and mm-hmm. uh, it was just a kind of mostly mindfulness of the body and body sensations and experiencing everything like emotions and thoughts through those sensations. Um and that he the retreat began with just a kind of awareness of the breath, which is a practice most people get familiar with first, just resting your attention on the feeling of the breath and bringing your attention back when it wanders, which is continuous. Um, and then this awareness of the body. So right at the end, Goenka uh, led a metta, M-E-T-T-A, mm-hmm. retreat, uh, med- meditation. And that was almost like a ceremonial way of, of ending the retreat. 
Metta means loving kindness in Pali. So that was the moment I heard, oh, there's another style. There's another way of practicing. And that's kind of interesting. It's all about love. It's about filling your being with the sense of love. That's how you start and extending it to all others. And I longed for that, certainly. And I looked for that for. And that became your sweet spot. Yeah. Right. And did you, were you aware of that at that moment? Like, this is going to be my thing? No, because I was so naive. I was so young. And I didn't know how to, I mean, I knew that there was a way of doing it intensively. Um, with structure and stuff, but I didn't know what it was. Mm-hmm. And and just so we're clear, like so the vipassana, you're you're it's really focused on the breath, but the actual practice of of meta is repetition of a mantra, but not a mantra in the traditional sense. It's mm-hmm. sort of like these sayings, right, right. where you're emitting loving kindness <laughs> into the world. <laughs> yeah, it's it, we consider it like a practice of generosity. So it's offering, mm-hmm. you know, instead of um, looking through you. I look at you and, and think, may you be happy, may you be peaceful, or whatever the particular mm-hmm. thing is. And so from there, where do you go from there? Dwinka? You um, meet Deepa Ma shortly there, after that? Uh, I met her probably a year later, or nine months later. Mm-hmm. I stayed in India. I practiced with other teachers. I practiced with Tibetan teachers. I um, ended up going back to Bodh Gaya, which is where I started with Goenka and kind of continuing on. In that tradition. So I probably met her that summer, summer of 71, Mm -hmm. something like that. And uh, I stayed beyond my year away from Buffalo, but then I went back and I did what I needed to do to get two years of independent study credit. So I did that and then I went back to India. So ultimately, you were in India for like four years, though, Almost on and years, off? Almost yeah, like three yeah. and a half years, yeah. And, and the idea at the time was you were just going to stay there, right? Yeah, like my idea was, was that I was going to stay there. Uh-huh. So Deepa Ma had a different plan for you. Yeah. And, and, and unbeknownst to you, that plan begins to manifest. So yeah. you, you come back yeah. with no intention of, of carrying out this edict no. that she had laid no. forth for you. But ultimately, that's that's basically what transpires. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Ramdas. I don't know when he came back actually, but he was back. And uh, Joseph Goldstein, whom I'd met in my first retreat, and we, we were good friends. He'd come back about six months before I did. And uh, Ramdas was teaching. Uh, Nirupa Institute had just opened up that summer in Boulder. It was their mm-hmm. inaugural summer, and is the first Buddhist institute now university in the country. And uh, Ramdas had like a mega class of like a thousand people. And Trung Paribache, who was the same one who uh-huh. said to me, you know, follow the pretense of accident. It's his school. He founded it. Wow. So he had like some of the same and some different thousand people class. And Ramdas divided his class into like the meditation subgroup and the chanting subgroup. So Joseph was doing the meditation subgroup. And Jack Cornfield was there teaching mm-hmm. his own class, mm-hmm. living down the hall. So. The joke, although it was absolutely true, when I sort of did what I needed to in New York, was that of all the this group of people who had gotten quite close in India, Joseph was the only one with a job and an apartment, so we all <laughs> right. went to Boulder. Everybody like kind of flopped at his place. Yeah, right? we did. There were yeah. like nine of us living in this one bedroom uh-huh. apartment. He tells this story and said it was absolutely horrible for him. He's a very meticulous person. I'm sure, we drove him insane, but he said until he stopped thinking of it as his apartment. And it was just we're all living together. Right, like he was a rather fastidious yeah. gentleman. Yeah, so. Yeah. You know, he, had to, he had to have his own journey with non-attachment. That's with that. right, he did. <laughs> <laughs> we all moved in. Uh-huh. So um, he uh, was quite popular with the students and was asked to stay on for the second summer session. So I stayed on with him. Uh, and then we were invited to teach a one-month retreat, which we did. That was the first retreat we taught. So we did that, and then we were invited to teach a 10-day retreat up in, or two-week retreat up in Vancouver. So I think Jack and Joseph and I all went up mm-hmm. there. And then it was just like that. We were sleeping on people's living room couches, right. and we had nothing. And a letter would come and say, would you come teach a retreat? And we said, oh, yeah, let's do that. You right, know? so you're just like this traveling band of merry yeah. meditati- yeah. meditation people. Yeah, we were. <laughs> Yeah. But you're getting, I mean, people are showing up for this, right? Like it's Some people were, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. I, maybe if we had 35 people, 40 people, 50 people were ecstatic. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, this leads to you founding the Insight Meditation yeah. Society in, in Massachusetts, right? Yeah, yeah. So when what year was that? What, how many years after in that was that? Okay, so, so that was two years. So this all happens in a pretty rapid yeah. succession, yeah, yeah. right? 
you take yeah. over this large house and uh, monastery. Okay, it, was a mo- it was a monastery. <laughs> it's an initiate. Yeah, and you. It's a really large house. <laughs> you institutionalize this, yeah. and that exists to this day, yeah. which is amazing, yeah. right? And I and I love how it was kind of. Uh, it was a lark, right? Like, is anybody going to show up? Like, oh, how are totally. we going to pay the mortgage at this place? And totally. that kind of thing. It was like, well, what happened before then was that uh, we were just like crashing at people's houses and responding to these letters. And somebody has said, I think in, a, in great defense, uh, he said, I have another house in Felton, like a rental property. Why don't you go there and stay there for a while? So that's why I was so amused when Jason moved to Felton. I said, Felton, right. that's where we started out. It was like our first address in uh-huh. this country. So we we went to this house and we did the only thing we knew how to do, which was opened it as a retreat center. So like three extra bedrooms or something like that. And uh-huh. people would come and do their own retreat and we'd feed them. And Jack Cornfield taught his first retreat ever in that living room. There were 19 people. Wow. And um, somebody came through and he said, you know, why don't you start a real retreat center? Like, and all the people I know who can really help you, they're in Massachusetts. So we went back east. Uh, mm. And we looked up and down the east coast and finally found this property in Barry, which was a novitiate. And um, it cost $150,000, like this huge institutional building and 80 acres of land. So, of course, we didn't wow. have $150,000 uh-huh. in 1975. And so we raised $50,000. The Fathers of the Blessed Sacrament gave us a $50,000 mortgage, and we couldn't get a bank mortgage. Mm. So three very brave people personally took out loans. Wow. So we could open the door. So our mantra really for the first year was, can I always close in a year? Right. And Which didn't make them very happy. Mm. But uh, that was our mantra, because who knew? Amazing. Was there a specific moment where you kind of consciously realized that Deepa Ma's <laughs> you know, prophecy was coming true for you? I think there was, and it was years later. Yeah. I just kept thinking, you know, I'll do it for a while, I'll do it for a few months, I'll do it. And then I thought, mm-hmm. no, this is it. This is my life, actually. Yeah. And, I mean, could you have imagined that you would have, you know, become this legendary teacher? No. <laughs> you know, to travel around the world and get celebrated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, not at all. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. It's everything. It, it's, uh, it's, it's quite, it's been quite an amazing journey for you, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to talk about, uh, this idea, and you address this in the book, and I've talked about this in the past on the podcast, but I think it's super important. And it, it it's, you know, the, the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves and how we get caught up in these narratives that, that don't serve you, you know, mm-hmm. where these stories come from and how we can, you know, decouple that narrative and begin the process of telling mm-hmm. ourselves a new story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the book, I, also, I write about uh, if you have a kind of a prevalent, frequent, you know, similar critical voice, like your inner critic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what's good is like, give it a persona, give it a name, give it a wardrobe. So I named my inner critic Lucy after the (laughs) character in the Peanuts comic strip, with apologies to all the Lucys in the world. Um, I'd seen this cartoon where in the first frame, Lucy is talking to Charlie Brown and she says, you know, Charlie Brown, what your problem is? The problem with you is that you're you. (laughs) Then in the second frame, poor Charlie Brown says, well, what in the world can I do about that? Then in the third and final frame, Lucy says, I don't pretend to be able to give advice. I merely point out the problem. <laughs> and somehow whenever I was walking by this desk, I would see that cartoon and my eye would fall right on the line. The problem with you is that you're you. Because that Lucy voice had been so dominant in my early life. And I really credit my meditation training for uh, basically having a different relationship to Lucy, you know, instead of on the one hand believing her completely, like you're right, Lucy, you're always right, or on the other hand, hating her and fearing her and being ashamed and all of that, I, I realized I had two ways of approaching her. One was, Hi, Lucy, like I see you, you know, and the other was, Chill out, Lucy. Right. And, you know, packed into that is the idea of becoming the observer yeah. as opposed to identifying with that voice as being part and parcel of who you are. That's right. right. Like wrapping it up into your identity. Yeah. And it's exa- and it actually happened very soon after I saw the cartoon. Something great happened for me. And my first thought was, it's never going to happen again. Right. And well, that's being the-, the observer was different than yeah. saying, you're right. You know? mm-hmm. 
it's the negative bias, right? And you yeah. talk about this in the book as well. Like we're, we're hardwired, we're predisposed to identify these, these mm-hmm. negative mm-hmm. things that occur to us and then, you know, choose to string those together and create this story about who we are, how we got here and what's going to happen to us in the future. That's right. Right. So yeah. to expand on that a little bit. Well, I mean, I think it, it, something that can be confusing for us is the difference between intentionality and coercion. And we use a lot of intentionality in these approaches because we are conditioned in usually toward, say, negativity. If you're thinking about your day and almost like evaluating yourself, like, how well did I do today? It's not uncommon to pretty well only think about the mistakes and what you didn't do that well and you didn't show up that well and you didn't say that really great. Or And it takes intentionality to kind of say anything else happened today. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not hypocrisy it's not denying that there were issues you know but um it's not all that happened right so to get to a truer bigger picture we have to actually move our attention consciously toward the good Mm -hmm. you know anything good happened today any good within me um and and that's kind of elasticity or flexibility of attention it's also part of the meditative process um but it begins really with seeing the story because Not only do we tell stories about ourselves, but others tell stories about us. Right. And so um, those can be very unconscious. And we tell stories about other people. And we tell stories about other people, exactly. You know, there's somebody, I also tell this story in the book, somebody um, told me, a writer friend of mine, he'd given a lecture somewhere, and in the course of the lecture, he mentioned how reading Proust, Remembrances of Things Past, have been so crucial for him at some stage of his development. And he was at dinner after the lecture, and, and a group of people came up to him. This woman came forth, and his his assumption about her, his thought about her was, oh, she looks like poorly educated. You know, she's probably not very smart. Mm-hmm. And then she said to him, I was at your lecture. So his heart kind of sank, you know, what's she going to say? And then she said, I just want to say that I find reading Proust in the original French much, much more fulfilling. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, all right. <laughs> yeah. So in thinking about that, like I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, of course, the story I tell myself about myself, but also the story that I tell about the other people that I encounter throughout my day. And that story is generally reflective of my own state of mind and how mm-hmm. I feel about myself. Mm-hmm. Like if I feel good about myself, I'm probably going to tell a more flattering version of Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. these other people that i encounter throughout my day um but when you when you really kind of analyze it like you realize like over the course of your life billions of things have happened to you billions right and we extract out you know these 10 things that happen over the course of our life and why we identify with them so deeply so thoroughly that they infect and invade you know every how we see ourselves every decision that we make how we interact with other people the words that come out of our mouth the kind of entertainment we choose to you know enjoy whatever it like it's it's amazing how pervasive Mm -hmm. it is Mm -hmm. And it's so cemented that the idea of even looking at that or being critical of the veracity of that, let alone reframing it, is something I think most people don't even begin to engage in. Do you agree? That's true. That's absolutely true. Um, Which is why I think seeing the story is maybe it's the first and the most critical step. Because a lot of people don't even believe that. You know, Mm -hmm. I, I was teaching somewhere and somebody said... I don't really see how others can tell stories about us because they don't know us. How could they be telling a story about us? And I said, I think everything is telling a story about us. I mean, architecture tells a story about us. Uh, the retreat center I co-founded, the Insight Meditation Society, just um, we built um, this sort of structure so that people in wheelchairs can come in the front door. And it's really big mm-hmm. and not very pretty, you know. Uh, because previously people in wheelchairs had to go around the side and then down the back, you know, it's snowy and cookie and, uh, it wasn't the right story, you know, to be telling people about belonging or inclusion. Right. And so, you know, we raised all this money, we built this thing and I find it personally very treacherous because I learned, I was a New Yorker. I learned how to drive when I was older. Right. And I'm not that great a driver and I'm parked <laughs> somewhere beyond and I have to like back out, you know, it's like protruding into the driveway and, and I really don't like it, but it's the right story. Mm-hmm. You know, and we don't realize how much we're impacted by all of those 
uh, views coming toward us about who we are. Mm-hmm. And it, it takes a great deal of integrity to have a sense of, though, this is who I am, actually. Mm-hmm. And the process of, of really engaging that comes back again to honing your attention, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and you kind of lay it out in the book in this four-step process that you call RAIN, right? Can you walk me through that? Sure. RAIN is something that is often used, especially when um, a difficult emotion comes up, but you can use it many, many ways. So let's say anger comes up uh, in your experience. Rather than dismissing it or explaining it or hating yourself for it or plotting revenge, you want to just look at the feeling. And this is something that's rare with strong emotion. Usually we get so captivated by the object. Like if you really, really want something, you think about the thing. Like I just bought a new car, you know, so it's like what color, you know, mm-hmm. what, what thing, what feature. We very rarely kind of pivot our attention to look at the feeling itself. Like what does it feel like to want something so much? Or what does it feel like to be so angry or so frightened? So that first that's the first step. It's kind of pivoting. And then we apply this acronym RAIN. The first is recognize what's happening. Like, oh, it's anger. Uh, the second is acknowledge it or accept it. You know, don't add on to it the shame and the distress and the fear mm-hmm. and all of that. Just be with it as it is. Uh, the third is I is investigate. You know, look into it, not... Why is it here and what am I going to do about it? But if we really look at a state of anger, we will likely see fear. We will see sadness. We may see grief. We'll likely see helpless, helplessness. Um, and we have a much clearer sense of what is actually cooking, you know, below mm-hmm. the surface. And we also see it's constantly changing. Look at that. You know, it has just kind of this nature of uh, arising and passing away. And then N, not non-identification, is... You know, you don't have to fall into, I'm such an angry person, I will be forever. This itself is a passing state. And um, it's a very different way of being with those kinds of emotions. Mm-hmm. One of the things you talk about in the book, you know, a lot of people, their entry point for meditation is this desire to quell the monkey mind, right? Like I've got, I just, my mind, I can't, you know, it's insane. And, and you had a kind of, interesting take on that like it's not about getting rid of that as much as it is not identifying with it or Mm -hmm. coming into a different kind of relationship with that yeah yeah. i think it's very much about coming into a different kind of relationship with that because you can't get rid of it you know i mean that that's first of all a hopeless task and uh it's very embattled you know it's like Mm -hmm. tiring and maybe more than anything these days if i'm introduced as a meditation teacher well, probably more than anything, people will respond with, I'm so stressed out, I could use some of that. But second comes, I tried that once, I failed at it. Right. Because that's what people's notion is. I should have a totally blank mind. I shouldn't have any thoughts. I should have only beautiful thoughts. Anxiety shouldn't come back. I shouldn't get sleepy. Whereas we say that the essence of the meditation is not what's happening. It's how we're relating to what's happening. And so any of that might happen, but you could be different with it. You could be more centered, you could be more balanced, you could be mm-hmm. more aware, you could be kinder. Uh, all of that comes into play as we evolve in the meditation. So it's not that easy to describe as a metric. You know, it's easier to say, well, that doesn't happen anymore, or I don't get distracted anymore. But to say, I come back from distraction more gracefully with a better sense of humor, mm-hmm. that's not that easy, but that's really what happens. Yeah, it's a gradual thing. I mean, you tell the story uh, in the book of dropping the glass, Yeah, right? Like thinking that this practice is not really doing anything yeah. for you yeah. until you have this situation where you drop this, gla- this glass yeah. and you don't react the way you usually do. Yeah. You react with sort of a, you know, a more loving yeah. you know, yeah, exactly. response to yourself, yeah. right? Yeah. But I think ancillary like sort of tangentially related to this idea of, you know, people saying I tried meditation, it didn't work for me because, you know, my monkey mind's out of control. Like baked into that is this sense of, of like perfectionism, right? Like yeah. if I can't do it perfect, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, holding yourself to this certain standard and the kind of, you know, violence that's yeah. associated yeah. with yeah. that and, and how that's really anti-love right it's isolating and it's 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 separating yourself from others and yourself so can you elaborate on that a little bit one of the pillars of self-compassion as a psychological theory in current western psychology 
is um, understanding we're part of a human family. You know, like when you blow it, you're not the only person in life who's ever done that. And and that's a big ingredient in that kind of changed relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, which again, it's not laziness or, or excuses for what you've done or are doing, but it's understanding this is part of the human condition. And we can pick up, we can begin again. This is resilience in effect. And so um, we do have notions of perfection, never thinking that perfection really, it never lasts, you know, like you have the perfect piece of fruit and then it starts to decay mm -hmm. or I just bought a new car and it's like, Honestly, when I left it, someone had pooped on it, some creature, and a bird, obviously, you know, like, not a bear, but uh, it was like, oh, no, I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, like, where's my perfect car? Right, like making peace with the fact that truly nothing is static. Nothing like our static. human brains want to believe that, you know, w there will always be democracy in America. Well, maybe I'm not so sure right now. You know yeah, what I mean? Like no, just certain That's things true. that we take for granted, like my wife will always be there and I'll always live in this house That's and right. all of these things. And, 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 and it's scary to think that, that, you know, to really embrace that impermanence, yeah. but, yeah. but there's a freedom in that, right? Yeah. That allows you to yeah. decouple from, you yeah. know, these, this sense of perfectionism and other traits that, well, yeah, it's, it's free because it's true. You know, right. it's like, it's not like this fanciful spiritual notion you're trying to superimpose on reality. It is reality. Mm -hmm. And the further we get from reality, the more we hurt. Right. Because we're like banging our head against the wall. One of the, the benefits for me of mindfulness practice and meditation is developing a, you know, sort of a more uh, objective and expansive understanding of of certain character traits and my relationship to them with the extent to which they lead me astray or you know propel me forward so an example of that in my case is you know self-will like for my whole life i thought everything good that ever happened to me is because i buckled down and worked hard for it worked harder for than anybody else i overcame this talent deficit gap and was able to like get shit done right mm -hmm. uh but it's that same uh same trait that has led me down many a dark alley, mm -hmm. right? Like sort of that self-reliance um, has detached me from, you know, a greater mm -hmm. sense of, uh, you know, engagement mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and when I was struggling with drugs and alcohol, it was mm -hmm. the key, mm -hmm. you know, preventative element from mm -hmm. me allowing myself mm -hmm. to get sober because I, I associated surrender with defeat or That's weakness, right. yeah. et cetera. So can you talk a little bit about like how our relationship with our, character traits and you know how we can develop mm -hmm. a, you know a better understanding of how they mm -hmm. work and how mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. you know transcend them well i think that holds true even for the stories we tell ourselves i mean a right. lot of those stories served a very useful purpose in some stage of development you know when you were putting your alcoholic parents to bed or you know you were all alone and trying to struggle you know uh i don't mean you <laughs> you know your story but because i don't know your story but um you know, when one is, is weaving a story to uh, survive, basically, you know, one's circumstances often as a child, that's a useful story. But when right. it becomes the singular story, then we're stuck. And you know? it becomes very difficult to let go of that. It's very difficult. Right? Because to you have it. identified so completely with it. And it served you to some extent, right. you know, and may no longer be serving and you, you want at it, you're, all. You're, you're, and you you become blind to how it's not serving you, yeah. right? Because yeah. you are so self-identified yeah. with it. Yeah. And so how do we work our way out of that? Well, it's, it all comes back to <laughs> honing your attention, honing right? Your attention. And these practices of mindfulness and meditation. Yes, yeah. definitely. But since you mentioned recovery, you know, uh, there's an amazing role for community as well. You know, it's like that fellowship in the recovery community um, is magnificent. I, I wish I could redesign, you know, a, 12-step group for everything. Yeah. You know, everything. Because, well, the principles are applicable to every yeah. human being and whatever they're challenged by. Yeah. I, I mean, think. I've worked with people and I, I looked at them and they have you know, terrible family situations. And I said, please tell me someone drinks so right. you can go to Al-Anon, you, know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, like, please. Uh -huh. And I said, sorry, I don't drink. Said, right. Well, you know, um, but because that plays a strong role too. It's like we, f we reformulate our sense of what's normal, mm -hmm. you know, in, in human relationship through relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that, that can be very powerful as well, but mm -hmm. a tremendous amount comes back to honing attention. Right. And the, the journey really, you know, at the, at this, at, you know, at the risk of 
sort of re- being reductionist about this whole thing is that you, know, you really have to engage this inward journey and embrace it if you want to get to this place of not completion, but you know, sufficient wholeness where you can love yourself and, and be capable of, of, of loving another and not looking to someone else. You know, it's like that idea, you know, that Jerry Maguire, like you complete me is, you know, such a, a lie that so many people buy into Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, quite honestly leads them astray and further away from what they're seeking. Yeah, definitely. And and you will find it everywhere. You know, it's just like pulverizing us that message, Mm -hmm. you know, from every direction. And, and uh, that's another role for community, actually. It's like people to step away together from the uh, prevalent messaging of the society and to reinforce the strength. Say, I want to look differently. I want to look at it from another angle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, it's a, we're having an amazing moment right now because, you know, meditation and mindfulness, these things are now very much of the zeitgeist, you know, and for the majority of your career, they really weren't. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I would imagine that this cuts both ways for you. You know, on the one hand, it's kind of amazing. Now there's all this science and people are talking about these ideas that you've been teaching for so long. And it must be very gratifying on a certain level to see the mainstream consciousness uh, adapting and adopting these Mm -hmm. tactics and practices but at the same time i would imagine there's some level of you know kind of uh bastardization of you know these these principles and traditions that you hold so dear Mm -hmm. as they become kind of diluted so that they can Mm -hmm. be digestible Mm -hmm. to the Mm -hmm. average Mm -hmm. human being Mm -hmm. so how do you like what is your opinion definitely well sometimes i identify myself just this morning to somebody as I guess being on the left wing fringe of the mm-hmm. of the orthodoxy because I am of the orthodoxy, you know I had a you could say a classical education, um, and I I really studied with immensely wonderful teachers mm-hmm. and my own teacher told me to teach that's the old fashioned way, you know many many people come up to me and say I'm a mindfulness teacher and I don't even know what that means anymore. It used to be I'd say well who was your teacher because then I'd know something like. They said Thich Nhat Hanh, I think, a social action. If they said somebody else, I think, oh, you know, that's like intense concentration or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I don't even know what it means anymore. Um, anybody can be a mindfulness. Anybody teacher, can be right? mindfulness. No, Go for no, it. No, no barrier it. to entry. Right? It's the Wild West. You know, there's no licensing. There's nothing. But on the one hand, I am, I am of the far left wing because I think it's great. I, I think it's tremendous. So many times somebody will come up to me and say, I'm a mindfulness teacher, and the next thing I'll say is I'm teaching that hellish prison. And I think, well, I'm not. You know, mm-hmm. like, God bless you. That's great. Uh, you know, people are sincerely motivated, and mostly, and and uh, really doing a great service to a lot of people. You know, I have great issues around a couple of things. One is the nature of the training. Um, there's an emphasis these days in this society, in this time, on scaling, as though that was mm-hmm. the the greatest virtue, you know, that fewer people going to a greater depth is not enough. It needs to be more and more and more people doing the thing, even if it's quite superficially. And so that means you need more and more and more instructors or you need, you know, and so how are they trained? You know, are they trained or Mm -hmm. are they just out there? And it's not good for them as people, the instructors, and it's not really serving the other people. I was reading a study the other day, um, that, you know, the headline was surprising to me. It said something like mindfulness, in contradiction to many other studies, mindfulness does not um, lead to empathy. And I thought, I don't get that because I've read so many studies, and I know it anyway, but, you know, I've read so many studies that show the opposite. So then I was reading the actual study, and it turned out that the training, the mindfulness training was five minutes long. <laughs> Literally, right. it was yeah, five yeah. minutes long. and And I thought, oh, my God. And then... The, you know, the principal investigator and people were challenged about that. And they said, well, these other studies were just using five minutes of meditation and they showed something or other. So that was like the standard. And I thought five minutes is like, you know, yes. <laughs> not uh, enough. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, that there's still a long way to go. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's what I read into that. Um, but there is something about, you know, the, the, the respect for the teacher. You know what I mean? I mean, right now it's like, we have access to, you know, at our fingertips in our, in everybody's pocket, you know, you have the universe available to you and you can 
access these practices, whether it's through Headspace or Dan's app, Ten Percent Happier. Yeah. I know you you're yeah. involved yeah. in that, and you know there's a, there's a plethora of other ones that probably vary in quality. The good information is available, but there's also you know a lot of garbage, so it requires a little bit more discernment. But that tactile experience of like sitting at the foot of a master, yeah, yeah. you know, we've sort of gotten away from that, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and I think there's a reverence for that that we should perhaps appreciate a little bit more fully. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a beautiful thing. And it's like, when I, you know, when my friend Joseph Glistein was um, first in Asia, he was actually in the Peace Corps and he was uh, just a school teacher uh, teaching English and he said when he walked into the room, his, he was in Thailand, his students would bow because it's a culture of respect for the teacher. You know, and like we're like hurling chairs at our teachers, right. and, you know, like, you yeah, know. it's different. It's different. Um, you know, on some level, though, I guess the counterpoint is, I mean, look, you know, my personal story, like when I got out of rehab, like I started going to yoga and I went to the yoga st- class in Brentwood where they played hip hop music and there was lots of pretty girls. And I don't know whether I would have gone to yoga otherwise, but that was my welcome mat. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it allowed me to walk in the door and yeah. I've since gone yeah. on a journey with that that has taken yeah. me to a very yeah. different place. Yeah. But, but had I been told like, you have to do it this way and you've got to find this kind of teacher, like I might not have walked through that door to begin with. So there's a, you have to kind of, um, have a respect for the individual and say, look, let, let's just get you attract. Let's dangle this like yeah, shiny yeah. object yeah, in yeah, front yeah. of you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And trust that if this resonates with you, that you'll then grab that and, and take it to a different place. Yeah. I mean, I think that's very true. And, and that, um, you know, as a teacher, like you kind of have to find your own place, like what feels right to you in terms of the context, the languaging, the, uh, you know, do you teach a yoga class where people chant "Om" or do they, you mm-hmm. know, think they're stretching? Um, right. It could be anything, and it's all beneficial to someone. Mm-hmm. And you know, as a as an individual looking for a system or a teacher, I think I, I know it's a weird and awkward way of saying it, but I usually say you have to be a consumer. You know, you have to feel what's right for you and go there. You know, don't hang out with the people in the place and the mm-hmm. where you feel like, oh, this is weird. You know, right. Yeah, because then you're not, in the long run, you're going to tap out, right? Yeah, yeah. But on this subject of teachers, you know, Ram Dass talks about this. Like we, you know, in our, in our culture, we have great reverence for the intellectuals, you know, and he uses Lincoln and Einstein, and we put mm-hmm. these people up on a pedestal, and, or, or athletes, right? LeBron James, you know, Michael Jordan, these people, these are the people that, that are the icons of our culture. What we don't do is celebrate the spiritual masters, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the great teachers of, of developing consciousness like they mm-hmm. do in India, you know, and I could see you as a young person mm-hmm. in India, like realizing that's very much the culture there, yeah. right? Yeah. That yeah. respect and that yeah. reverence for these, these individuals that hold that, you know, capacity that we just lack in our Western yeah. culture, yeah. you know, is there <clears throat> like... Can we shift that? Like, can do you see a future in which we can develop that kind of reverence, or you could see the ascension of of these kinds of consciousness, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, consciousness wielding individuals, um, you know, holding that kind of stature? Mm-hmm. I think I can, and I think it's going to come about in a kind of strange way because uh, as I was listening to you just now, I started thinking about my first trip to the Soviet Union. And going to the um, grave of different grave sites of different poets, and you'd think these people were rock stars, mm-hmm. you know. And and we don't treat poets that way either, necessarily, or artists, or you know. And I think this is the kind of time where, when people talk about social action and social justice and movements, I always say, "Well, what about the artists?" You know, like I have a feeling that's going to lead the mm-hmm. the way. And and. Uh, you know, people express their deepest values in different ways and have different strengths. But I think there's, there's going to be a whole breakaway of communication and expression through art, through through all those those media. And I think that's going to bring about a whole other sense of consciousness, mm-hmm. which will include kind of strict consciousness movements and, you know, people teaching meditation and things like that. Right. I think it's uh, it's going to form the kind of radical edge. Yeah, 
I would like to see that. I would yeah. like to see that yeah. happen. Well, we're certainly in a moment where you know we need art desperately yeah. for yeah. sure, and I could see that. You know, I, I think that the that there's you know a fertile environment yeah. for that yeah. to occur. You know, but at the same time, we're you know we're more distracted than ever. Yeah. You know, yeah. these devices yeah. that we have that we think are are connecting us more deeply with our fellow human are actually alienating. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I have a weird relationship with social media because of what I do. Like, I'm very connected and tapped in. And and it's allowed me to connect with amazing people. Yeah. You know, like, I've, yeah. I've been able to meet in person, you know, phenomenal individuals all across yeah. the world as a result of that platform. Mm-hmm. But I have to keep my relationship with it in check so that I'm not just yeah. sitting at home. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, what kids just connected, <laughs> right? So, so it's like, yeah, I can use the 10% happier app, or I can use headspace. Yeah. And, and, and yet that's not a replacement for being out in the world yeah. and, and yeah. cultivating, yeah. you know, community and, yeah. and these things. So how do you talk about that when you when you're teaching these principles? Well, I think it's really true. And I think it is a matter of restraint. And I also, I love technology and I, I think of myself often at the age of 18 going off to India and like so scared and so determined. And I, you know, I'd never even been to California before mm-hmm. when I went to India and, but I needed to go to India. You don't have to go to India as you say anymore. And, uh, very, very fine teachings and, and approaches are available through your phone. Um, but what's missing is the community aspect often. And so. Uh, it can't replace having a living sense of some connection with another human being, mm-hmm. uh, but it often does. And so I think it's tremendously freeing. When I've taught things online, you know, and I've seen, um, you know, people in Poland doing it or, you know, people all over the world doing it. And uh, it's amazing to me that it really is kind of this global community now. You know, it's not... It's not yeah, it allows these to, ideas to travel yeah. you know, instantaneously. It's amazing. People can have the experience, you know. They don't have to think wistfully of, like, if only I could get a visa, you know, or, right. or whatever it might be. But we, we, I think, definitely need... First of all, we need discipline, you know, because I have a friend who, um, every time we have dinner together, we'll tweet it out. Each of us will tweet, oh, having dinner mm-hmm. with so-and-so, and... Once we were in a restaurant doing that, and somebody knew him, and they came up to him and said, are you going to talk to each other at all? You're just going to stay on your phones all the time. And it was, yeah, people do stay on their phones all the time. Yeah, the optics are not great. No, the if optics two, like, are not great. meditation teachers are <laughs> yeah. on their phone sitting across from each other at a yeah, restaurant. Really. <laughs> exactly. It's just what it looked like. It's yeah. just what it was. Uh-huh. Um, but I, I think you know we can, be reason- we can learn to be reasonable about it. The other thing people tell me, uh, like I have a professor friend who was talking about his students, and he said people, his students, he felt, really used the media of, you know, online communication, social media, uh, just as a means of comparison and kind of putting other people down. Like, mm-hmm. people don't post a photo of their imperfect meal. Mm-hmm. Of um, course. You know, and, and I said, I first I said, I, I wonder if that's an age thing, because my people are usually posting, like, about their shoulder surgery or something <laughs> like that, you know, <laughs> our aches and pains and complaints, but... Um, there's something about that, you know, that some consciousness that needs to enter. Like, what are we really trying to communicate? Mm-hmm. And if we feel completely inauthentic over and over and over again, because it's just some act, you know, then it's clearly not serving us and we need to find that somewhere else. Yeah, it, it requires discernment. You know, I mean, you can use that to, to, again, go back to the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. You can use that um, to fuel that story that's not serving you. Look at how much better everybody else is doing. Everybody's doing yeah. great. I'm doing terrible. It's never going to happen for me. Yeah. You know, whatever that self-defeating narrative is. Yeah. So, and, and that discernment is a journey towards self-love, right? Yeah. So back yeah. to, back to, back to, you know, <laughs> back to real love. And, and within that is, you know, judgment, right? And so how do we, you know, and healthy boundaries, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. Right. So how do we, exercise healthy boundaries in the practice of real love and self-love. Like when we're, you know, if there's people in our life that, you know, that we need to exercise from our experience, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. like how do you do that in a way that's still compassionate? Mm-hmm, like how, mm-hmm. you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I mean, one of the things we would say is, is really having a sense of clarity about where in a way, like where love and compassion reside, which 
we would say is in one's motivation or intention. It's not in the action. So it's like, it's like the same as tough love, you know, Mm -hmm. um, or fierce compassion. Uh, the, the arena of the psyche that is supposed to be most transformed through the practice of, or deepening of loving kindness and compassion is the arena of motivation or intention. So if, for example, you have largely been motivated by fear in what you do or what you say or what you hold back from doing or saying, and you, deep in these qualities, you'll be largely motivated by a sense of connection. You know, but that doesn't determine what you'll do. Mm-hmm. You know, out of that care, that connection, even that kindness, in the moment, there's a, there's a real discernment that needs to take place, which is very, very contextual. You know, in this moment, in this particular point in time, in this relationship, what do I feel is the most skillful way to say this? Or most skillful thing to do? Is it yes or no? Mm-hmm. Is he giving them the money or not giving them the money? And, you know, we make mistakes for sure. I call it our best guess. But it's it's discernment. It's different than the care. And we conflate those two. And that's the place where people often say, well, I don't know about that love thing. You know, then I can only be sweet and say yes. And right. It gets, it gets murky if you're a people pleaser. Yeah, exactly. Because right? then you think self-love or loving others is 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 basically just always being available to, the, to what right. they want and and doing what they want to do and that's that's, right. that's a lack of self-love yeah, right because right. you, you yeah. aren't discerning and you're not creating a healthy boundary yeah i mean you have to and so uh i would I, so in teaching i go over that point again and again and again and again you know they're different you can be coming from a really loving motive a really loving place and your best guess of the right way to act in this moment in time is really fierce it's really intense. It's having a strong boundary. It's saying no. No, I'm not going to give you more money. No, you can't move in again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't have to feel like that indicates a lack of love in your heart because it doesn't necessarily at all. And the way you know the difference is by looking, you know, right. is by paying attention. This is all a journey towards self-actualization and, and, and really, you know, embodying your most authentic self, Mm -hmm. right. And, and getting to a place where you can trust your instincts Mm -hmm. and those impulses that arise are the signals that, you know, are the, the light, the lampposts Mm -hmm. on your, on your path. But if you're, I think it gets confusing because if you're not in a good place or if those impulses and instincts are being driven by, addiction or that unhealthy narrative then they're not they're not trustworthy instincts mm-hmm, right mm-hmm. so how do you how do you know when you can trust them and 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 allow them to light your path and when do you know like you know what like i need some more i got to do a little bit of more work before yeah. i can trust whatever's arising in me yeah well i mean it's never bad to have the thought i need to do some more work you yeah. know because we usually all need to do some more work but i think some of that has to do with community sometimes like other people saying you really should chill, you know, that was that was kind of harsh. Right. Uh, and sometimes it has to do with just buying time. Like I have a friend who who said she could never say no to people. And so in her meditation practice, one day she kind of brought up in her mind that kind of scenario as an act of creative imagination, like when she was asked a question where she really should say no. And she felt what was happening in her body, this kind of almost panic that would viscerally start taking over, like they won't love me anymore, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever. And she used that that sensation as a kind of feedback system so that when she was in an actual situation like at work and somebody would ask her that very kind of question and she would feel that sort of panic begin to come over her, she would say, I can't answer you quite yet, or I need a little time. Like she couldn't say no, Mm -hmm. but if she had more time, she could say no. So she right, really, it's like it's like uh, uh, writing out that email but not sending it. That's right, exactly. <laughs> Write out the email but don't send it. And so, you know, you need certain curbs in place like that. You know, that it's a matter of discipline. Rooms play. You know, like I'm gonna today whenever I write an email, I'm not gonna send it right away or something like that. That's a discipline. Um, but within that, you can you also need to be kind to yourself. You know, and not say I'm like a wretched person. I can never say no. You can say, oh, look at this. Here's that habit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not going to let it hold sway again. Mm-hmm. How do you create, you know, healthy boundaries around yourself when you know everybody wants a piece of you? You know, you know, it's it's like a it's it can be like a vampiric thing, right? Yeah. If you if you don't have that boundary, like everyone's sucking you dry. And mm-hmm. and as a teacher and as somebody who's holding a certain frequency that people want and and you know gravitate towards you, you got to take care of yourself, or you yeah. can't yeah. take care of them. Yeah. No, it's true, and and that. First of all, you need to remember 
that very fact. Yeah. You know, that that's very true. And then, um, you know, I feel really lucky. I still have teachers and I still consider myself a student and I still practice. And uh, without that, I can't even imagine, you know, what it would be like. And, right. And I think there's something about authenticity, which is very important because sometimes in trying to please that image, you know, and right, live you have up to, to that live image. up to yeah. you know, this idea of who everybody thinks that's you right. are. <laughs> that's right. That's yeah, right. It's crazy. draining. You know, I just told this story like a, a couple of trips ago. I was in the San Francisco airport and my flight was six and a half hours late. And I was fine for five and a half hours. So I was really mm-hmm. mellow. And then I was like really getting impatient and. Uh, and just then somebody came up to me and said, are you Sharon Salzberg? Right. And I thought, damn, you know, like should have come up an hour ago. You yeah. know, I was in a much better place. Or somebody taking a video of you chewing out the airline person. That's right. You know, and then yeah. it goes viral. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. You know? Uh, yeah. It's, it's gotta be difficult. I would imagine. So what does your practice look like? Um, I practice every day. Uh, different lengths. My goal is to try to do like 40 minutes a day. If not all at once, then in chunks, you know, Mm -hmm. um, I try to practice in informal times, like walking down the streets of, especially with loving kindness, uh, walking down the streets of New York city or sitting on an airplane, silently repeating, may you be happy or may all beings be happy. Uh, which is quite fun. It's a whole other way of being Uh in New York. Um, and I try to do retreats at least periodically, but it's the I think it's the everydayness of it that really saves me. Right. So there's the formal part of yeah. the practice, and then yeah. there's carrying that into your interactions in the world, which is yeah. a form of practice yeah. in and of itself. Right. Yeah. So what are the what are the challenges that you still face? Like when you have like what are the what are the things that you're working on overcoming or improving yeah. on? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's some of it is like this energy gap, you know, it's like every time I feel like I'm like at the right level of energy, something more is asked of me. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like I'm always at a gap pretty well and and needing to, you know, somehow meet that. Um, I think one of the greatest challenges I have is just like, it's not exactly a challenge. It's more like a, a process, you know, of feeling like... Um, it's it's a little strange when people kind of know your name, you know, mm-hmm. and but the things that make you happy are the things that always made you happy, you know, which are very simple. And so remembering that that's what counts, you know, and that's that's a life, that's your right. life. And it's simply being with friends or it's simply hanging out or looking at the flowers or I like the light in LA a lot, you know, mm-hmm. just looking at the light and and uh Remembering that that's my life, you know, and everything else is like this overlay that exists somewhere else. And And how does that get reconciled with, you know, this idea, you know, like of the Buddha, like I'm working towards enlightenment, you know what I mean? Like it it can be very achievement oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can get there, you know, (laughs) because I really like meditation as an art form and which is why, you know, I'd like to devote more time again to it just uh, for the sheer, you know, art form of it, you know, and, and the places one can go and in one's mind and consciousness and things like that. Um, I don't feel like driven to get enlightened in this lifetime. I think it's likely to take more yeah. than one lifetime. <laughs> uh, but I do feel it's possible. You know, I don't, I don't, um, think the ultimate goal of meditation is to be a little less stressed out. Yeah. You know, I think that there are things we're capable of as human beings, as ordinary human beings, uh, in the matters of wisdom and love that are incredible. And sure, I would like to be there, you know, and, and I, I've never lost sight of that, you know, that possibility. Have you met people that you feel are truly enlightened beings? Yeah. I mean, I think Deepama, for example, although she would never say she was completely done, you know, that would be, I mean, I can't even imagine her right. saying that. Um but she would be an example and like the most super humble person you can imagine. And her, her love, her compassion was also very maternal. It would be like, would you like another cup of tea? You know, or can I get you something? Or how was your journey? Or, right. Just grounded in the real world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you make of these stories that you hear, 
you know, more in the Hindu tradition of these, you know, famous, you know, yogis that go into the cave and don't eat for months on end or become yeah. breathitarians or, yeah. you know, these crazy stories of, you know, you hear these insane stories, right? Of like, they have superpowers almost, right? Are these apocryphal? Like, what no, do you I don't make think, of I don't think they're, I mean, some of them are probably apocryphal, <laughs> yeah. you know, some of them are probably completely untrue, but, uh, not necessarily. I mean, I think there's, um, at least in the Buddhist tradition, there's a, at some schools of the Buddhist tradition, there's a pretty clear delineation between paths of power and paths of wisdom. You know, so if you, if you develop really, really, really strong concentration, only, pretty much only, that's a path of power. Cause you're taking like the energy of the universe and bringing it to yourself. And, mm-hmm. um, it's from that place that people develop what we would call psychic powers or, paranormal ability so and it's from a place of mindfulness and clear seeing and wisdom that we develop qualities like love and you know so it's very different um although they they support one another sometimes but you could develop power without love and then all you've got is power the dark power the dark power (laughs) so they said deepama for example my teacher uh in her youth she was trained in those concentration techniques and she could do things like that and like what walk through walls or, uh, really? you know, um, go back in time and hear the Buddha give a talk or uh, go back in time and see where you were in your previous life or uh, visit different realms of ex- existence or um, things like that. She could, you know, mm. so, or you hear those new Crowley Baba stories about right. reading your mind and stuff like that. So right. I have or if friends. you read like autobiography of a yogi, there's yeah. lots of stories yeah. in there about stuff like that. Yeah. So I have a fr- I have friends who like are completely freaked out at the notion of Deepama walking through a wall. You know, yeah. and I say, I mean, well, that's that's heavy, right? Yeah, like, but it's like know? it's so irrelevant to who she was. You know, like people don't talk about. I mean, they say that she could take a potato and bake it in her hand and make it taste like chocolate. But people don't ever, yeah. I mean, who cares? No matter how much you or, like chocolate. You know? Like Neem Karoli, was it Neem Karoli? No, it was, was it Neem Karoli Baba? No, maybe it was Maharishi who took like a bunch of acid and it didn't, Maharishi, nothing, it nothing, Neem happened, Baba. nothing happened. Right? That was Neem yeah, Karoli Baba, yeah. yeah. Maybe, I don't yeah. know Maharishi <laughs> did, but definitely Neem Karoli Baba. And, you know, so, but I say to them, those very friends, I say, well, do you believe some of those Neem Karoli Baba stories about him knowing what was happening with your family in the States, which you didn't even know about yet. Or and they said, oh, absolutely, because that's the mind. That's not materiality. But if you ask somebody who you know has studied it, they'll say, well, what they do is they say, you know, material stuff is said to be made of earth, air, water, and space, or earth, air, water, and fire, and space. And they can separate the elements. Mm-hmm. So apparently when somebody like Tipa Mott looks at that wall, she sees the space. That's what she goes through. Mm-hmm. And it seems like a, it seems like almost like a less cultured or sophisticated attainment than your mind being able to, you know, it's, it's considered very, it's like fundamental in a way. So, um, I don't get why it's so, uh, bizarre to people compared to the other bizarre things that we, experience and accept yeah i guess it's a it's how you it's how you frame it right i mean it's so beyond our imagination to you know believe that somebody could do that but you know and we could go down that rabbit hole for a long time that's that's crazy stuff (laughs) but we should land this plane um (laughs) we'll get we'll get back to the more grounded space here you know people there's a lot of people that listen to this that are you know they're into they're into meditation they're into mindful practices there's also a lot of people that flirt with the idea and don't actually do it so somebody's listening to this and they're like you know the time is now like i'm i'm ready mm-hmm. like i'm i'm down with sharon how can i begin you know how how can i begin this journey like how, how can you kickstart somebody into mm. uh this adventure i think these days there's so many ways you can get dan harris's app for example 10 mm-hmm. percent happier or another app you know that you you feel interested in or a book um or a class, you know, I think the important thing is just enough clarity in the beginning so you don't torture yourself by ideas of what should be happening. And that doesn't take much, but some, some reassurance like, yes, it's normal to be thinking. It's okay that you always get distracted. You can just begin again. That's the point. And with that, then it's a question of your own practice. And so I usually say maybe whatever's comfortable for you, 15 minutes a day for a month or 10 minutes a day for a month. Just do that, you know, and then you'll see if you want to do it. 
yeah, make a commitment that's reasonable. Yeah. You know, that's not so outlandish that you're going to abandon it three days in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, create a little accountability around it. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. you talk about this a lot, like, you know, tell people this is what you're going to do yeah. and, and, and get yourself on the hook. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So that at least there's a little, you know, not shame, but like, you know, you're going to feel like, you, you know, you're, you're a little emotionally invested in this yeah. and there's yeah. some support for you, you know, and if you don't have anybody in your town or whatever, or any friends that are going to be of like mind, then seek it virtually, you know, yeah. use that computer yeah. in your pocket and, and find groups online. And, yeah. And, yeah. and these apps have accountability built into them as well, like reminders and, you know, little things That's like true. that that can, that can allow true. you to do that. Do you have like a, 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 um, loving kindness practice that you could kind of share somebody could, that somebody could walk away from this and, sure. and start to do. Sure. I mean, uh, the simplest one is probably choose like two or three phrases that are the gift you would like to give to yourself. Like, may I be peaceful? May I calm down? <laughs> you yeah. know, or, but they need to be big enough so you can then use the same, pretty much the same phrases for others. Uh, so that's why people use things like, may I be happy? May I be peaceful? Mm-hmm. And just sit quietly for a few moments and make that offering to yourself. And just keep repeating the phrases. Your mind will wander everywhere. Don't worry about that. Uh, you can let go of the distractions one by one. It's okay. And just come back to the phrases. Don't like count on some, you know, tremendous feeling coming up and, uh, just do it a little bit. Then think of somebody you really care about. Uh, usually someone who's helped you. They, even if you've never met them, they've inspired you. Um, and offer the phrases to them. Even if the words don't seem perfect, they're like a conduit for that way of connecting. And then, just for fun, have that person offer the phrases back to you mm -hmm. so that you're in the position of the recipient. Yeah, that's a weird feeling, yeah. right? Yeah. That brings up all kinds of weird emotions. It does. You know, it's it interesting when you do that. Yeah, so I just gave you a very provocative exercise rather yeah, than one that's, that's good. That's what about like, you know, sometimes like I'll develop a resentment against somebody else and, and yeah. it will like monopolize my thinking yeah, yeah. and it really undermines the quality of my day yeah, or yeah. my week, yeah. right? So, uh, you know, in recovery, they say like, you know, pray for that person, like wish them well. So there's a, I'm sure there's a loving kindness version of that mm -hmm. where you're like, wishing well on that person because yeah. you're the one who's suffering yeah, as a result right. of that resentment right? And, right and the path to freedom is by you know decoupling yourself from that emotion yeah. exactly and I, I wouldn't neglect in that case loving kindness for yourself uh i would intermingle it either start with yourself and move to that person or uh do yourself together may we be happy may we be peaceful because you're right you know of course resentment is such a corrosive relentless feeling and uh, it's so obsessive it's like the amount of time any of us can spend going through the list of someone's faults and then we go through it again and then again and then again and then again and you know it's very tiring mm -hmm. beautiful i think we did it all right how do you feel i feel great you feel I good mean, yeah <laughs> Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, the work you do is very meaningful, and I hope that you continue to do it. Um, the new book is fantastic. Uh, everybody should pick it up, along with the other 8 billion books that you've, <laughs> you've written. You've written, what, 10 now? This is number 10. This is number 10, right? And you have a podcast, right? I seem to, yeah. The Meta, the meta Hour, the meta right? Hour, yeah. So it's really great. I, I uh, In the course of preparing for this, I listened to a bunch of episodes, and I really enjoyed it. So that's very cool as well. And in the course of rolling out this book, I'm sure you're going to be out in the world in a way that you probably aren't usually. Are you, mm -hmm. Do you have some speaking engagements coming up, or I, can people uh, just find that on your website? Yeah, it's all on my website. Right. So awesome. Love wide. Love deep. See you guys soon. Peace. Plants. Yeah.